Welcome back to my channel. This topic was suggested by one of my viewers. IT leaders run a business, and in doing so, they have to understand key accounting terms. So today we're going to look at the difference between operating expenses and depreciation expense. Hi, I'm Steve Murphy. I'm a vice president at ARG, and while I work for ARG, this video is my own and not necessarily a reflection of the views or opinions of my employer. This channel is all about helping IT leaders make better business decisions. And this topic is near and dear to my heart. I used to be a certified public accountant, so I spent a lot of time understanding the difference between operating expenses and capital expenses. From an overview perspective, we're going to first go through the basic differences between the two, and then we're going to get into a little bit more detail. We're going to look at OPEX considerations first, then capital purchase types, then understanding what a capital expense is, and then how do you make the right decisions to whether or not to incur a capital expense or decide to go an operating expense direction. A basic definition of operating expense is an expense incurred in the operation of a business. But that doesn't really help us very much, does it? I like to think of an operating expense as a resource that's consumed that has no residual value at the end of the period. Let me uh, help you uh, understand what I mean by that. First, let's use some, a couple of examples that I think will be informative. An operating expense includes things like rent, payroll, utilities, and services. So let's look at payroll. Of course, your employees are assets of the business, but the uh, cost of, of supporting those employees through their payroll is limited to an individual period. At the end of the month, I don't have any residual value in that employee that I don't have to pay for in, separately in the future. That employee can stop working immediately and there's no, no residual value in, in that uh, employee's prior work product generally. Of course, they might have created something that would provide value elsewhere in the organization, but they themselves are not providing any additional value going forward. Rent is, a, is another good example. When I pay the rent every month, the value of that rent payment stops at the end of the month when I have to pay a new rent payment to continue to occupy the plant that we rent, for example, the, the, or the, the building that our plant is located in. Operating expenses are also recorded when they're consumed. That's another important element that differentiates an operating expense from a capital expense. Let's take a look at a basic definition of a capital expense. That's acquiring the capability or acquiring some capability that has value across many periods. It's considered an asset of the business. And I, um, an asset is something that it generally provides value over time. Your house um, that, you, that you might own is, is an asset. The car that you own is an asset. It's something that you consume or utilize over a long period of time. The asset is recorded when it's acquired, recorded on the books of the company when it's acquired, and then it's expensed incrementally over time. And there are different ways of expensing that over time we'll talk about in just a few moments. If an asset becomes no longer valuable before the estimated useful life term or period, then that asset has to be written off immediately because it's no longer providing value to the organization. And that can be a big expense on an uh, organization, an IT organization's um, uh, books or hitting their budget unexpectedly. So we want to avoid unplanned obsolescence of our capital investments. So let's take a look at some operating expense considerations. First of all, businesses always try to minimize operating expenses. So if you get into an operating expense framework, there's always going to be pressure on you to reduce those expenses. Because fundamentally, there are only two ways that a company can become more profitable. They can go off and increase profitable sales, or they can reduce expenses. And what do you think is easier for a management team when they have to quickly influence or impact their profitability. Well, reducing expenses is a lot faster and a lot easier than um, magically increasing sales. If they knew how to increase profitable sales, they'd be doing it already. But expenses are something that they can, uh, at least there's a, theor there's a theory that they can manage down aggressively when they need to. So operating expenses are always under pressure. Operating expenses have a secret value to an IT organization, and that's the option. So a value, uh, the value of an option uh, it arises when you can change course over time to better address the needs of your business. An option gives us the ability to do something different if you had, uh, than if you had purchased a solution outright. Typically, capital IT purchases have a five-year lifespan, five-year depreciation schedule, where an operating expense might have a two to three-year commitment. And after that two to three year commitment is over, 
you might go in a different direction or select a different solution. Those extra two years of flexibility can be very valuable to the organization in general. And therefore, the option to do something different sooner rather than later should be considered when you're deciding between purchasing a solution or uh, consuming it as an operating expense. Now let's flip the script and talk about capital purchases. So there are two main ways that companies purchase capital assets. The first one is to purchase it outright, write a check for it. But if your organization doesn't have the cash on hand or has better use for their cash on hand, you might want to finance it. And the financing options are typically a capital lease or a loan. Now loans are pretty easy to understand, but capital leases require some explanation because a capital lease on the surface may just look like another operating lease, like a, like a rent payment that you would make on a building. But when a lease meets one of the four following criteria, it becomes a capital lease and it has to be added as an asset. The, the item being acquired through the lease has to be added as an asset to the organization's books. And so those criteria are, one is if 75% of the useful life is consumed under the lease term. So if you have a five-year asset and your lease term is four years, that's going to be a capital lease because it consumes 75% of the five-year useful life. Another cr criteria for a capital lease is if there is a bargain purchase price. Some leases might have a dollar buyout clause at the end. That would be a bargain purchase option. Or if title conveys to the lessor at the end of the lease term. And the last one is probably the, more conf the most confusing one, where if the discounted cash flows of the lease equal 90% of the current value of the asset purchased. Now, discounted cash flows are a topic that I don't really think we need to go into here. With today's low interest rates, it's safe to say that discounted cash flows are slightly less than the total lease payments over time. As interest rates go up, that um, discounted cash flow value goes down. But today with very low interest rates, very low financing rates, you can pretty much assume that it's slightly lower. Let's say 10% lower than the aggregate sum of all the lease payments over the term. Now, I, IT leases, in my experience at least, are almost always capital leases. So that might just be an easy way of considering um, how, you, uh, how you might acquire IT resources through a lease. And generally that's because the asset depreciates uh, or becomes obsolete very, very quickly. From a booking perspective, you not only book the cost of the asset acquired, but any installation or implementation costs that come with putting that asset in service. So that's an important element to understand as well. And then lastly, it, you have to understand that any support or ongoing maintenance that you spend to keep that asset in service, those are probably going to be considered an operating expense. The only time that those types of investments might be considered a capital expense is if they significantly increase the capability of that asset or increase the useful life of that asset, then you may be able to capitalize those expenses or those outlays rather than charging them off as an operating expense. So that's how you purchase a capital asset. How does the, the expense hit the books? Well. When we purchase a capital asset and book that entire cost on our balance sheet as an, as an asset, on the asset side of the balance sheet, we then want to spread the cost of that asset over time, over the period of its useful life. And spreading that cost over time is referred to in accounting as depreciation. That's just the expense that you incur to incrementally charge off that asset as it serves its purpose. Now, there's another term that you may hear with when you're talking to your finance group, and that's called amortization. Amortization is a term that you use when you have an intangible or a soft asset, something that you may uh, make an investment in that will have a return over time. Developing software, for example, would be amortized. That cost of the development project would be amortized over time rather than depreciated. It's just a some, uh, difference in semantics. So let's do an example of depreciation. Let's assume that we buy a $100,000 asset and it has a five-year useful life. So there are two ways that you can depreciate that. Most companies use straight line depreciation. So the expense that would hit your budget or the organization's budget over those five years would be an even $20,000 per year, every year over five years, getting us to an aggregate value of $100,000. Pretty straightforward. But I suggest to our clients, they consider working with their finance team to develop an accelerated depreciation model. And there are a couple of advantages here. Uh, but let's talk about what accelerated depreciation is first. It's um, 
taking more depreciation earlier in the life of that asset and less as it ages. So in this schedule here, you might depreciate that $100,000 asset at $40,000 in the first year, then the second year would be $25,000, then $18,000, then $11,000, and $6,000. Again, the total of the depreciation adds up to that original $100,000 value, but we're just accelerating that or taking more earlier. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, when you first acquire the asset, you can typically adjust your budget for the depreciation of the acquired asset. So you get to adjust your budget by that $40,000 rather than the $20,000 that you would take on the straight line. Now that allows you then in the future years to build in budget reductions and so everyone is always pressed to reduce their budget year over year that builds in a budget reduction automatically into your uh, into your out years into your financial plan. You can also create more flexibility over time because remember as I said when a, an asset ex, uh, runs out of usefulness before the planned useful term that has to be written off. It's a lot easier to write off an asset in year four when it's been depreciated on an accelerated basis because the net book value, which is the difference between the original cost and the depreciation that's accumulated over time, the net book value will be much smaller and so therefore it's a much lower impact to your budget in terms of writing that asset off before the originally planned useful life. Now, once an asset is fully depreciated, you essentially can use it for free from a budgeting perspective. You're no longer paying anything for that asset except maybe the maintenance and support that you would incur on a regular basis. But um, I, I caution people with regard to sweating these assets for too long because once they do run out of that useful life or that, de uh, that depreciation period, your budget's going to go down dramatically because that depreciation is no longer hitting your budget. To replace, ultimately replace that asset, you're going to have to fight for a new budget to do that. And in some organizations, that may be easy. They may appreciate the fact that you sweated an asset longer than its planned useful life and are okay giving you more money to ultimately replace that asset when it's required. But some organizations will uh, ask you to find other savings elsewhere to make that um, replacement value budget neutral. So what's the right decision between an operating or a capital acquisition? I like to think that it really comes down to whether or not you're going to insource the management of that asset or outsource the management of that asset. Now, insourcing is less expensive, uh, usually dependent upon sweating that asset again um, beyond its typical useful life. That's where the real cost reductions do uh, come in, but it can also be inexpensive because you're using internal labor rather than an external vendor. And those labor rates tend to be much lower. But I would caution you when you're, con when you're considering the alternative between an operating environment versus a capital environment, make sure that you fully load your internal labor costs. And, and normally that load is at least 30%, sometimes as much as 50% of the direct hourly cost of, of those employees. Now, purchasing an asset is also restrictive over time, as we've talked about previously. So that needs to weigh into your consideration. You will be locked into that decision for a much longer period of time than if you were to, uh, if you were to solve the, the need through an operating environment. Now, when we're looking at an operating environment, it's normally an outsourcing model. It's generally more expensive than doing it yourself, but you get some serious advantages by outsourcing, like a deep bench for support. You're not dependent upon one employee knowing how to manage the asset. You have a, an organization that's charged with managing the asset and then generating the outcomes that, that you're seeking. You personally, or your organization as a whole, have to manage that vendor generally less because they have more experience with managing those assets, there's less engagement that you have to perform. You'll generally get better execution. And again, because of the shorter time frames of an operating or outsourcing agreement, you'll have more flexibility. Now, one other thing that I like to bring up in these conversations is, is when a private equity is involved or the organization is, is open to an acquisition being acquired by another company, they will frequently want to make capital investments rather than operating expense investments because uh, many business valuation models are very dependent upon earnings before interest taxes, depreciation and amortization, EBITDA. Now, 
EBITDA is very friendly to capital purchases. They are not charged to the income of the organization, so it can make the company appear more valuable because that depreciation and amortization is, is not charged uh, on, against the income that is using in that valuation model. However, it's been my experience that most private equity companies don't want to see a lot of IT capital investment because it just burdens the organization and limits their ability to, uh, to be agile, especially when you're looking to be acquired by another organization. Uh, they may or may not have any useful uh, purpose for the assets that you've acquired to run your organization. And over time, as they migrate the, the infrastructure from one to another, those assets may just be retired and charged off as a cost of the acquisition anyway. So um, I would have that conversation with your finance team if they're pressing you to um, to acquire solutions through a capital model. What are the purposes and would the company appear to be more valuable simply because it's more agile from an IT perspective? So that's our conversation on operating expense versus capital expenses. I hope you got some value out of this. And if you did, would you please like this video and thank you very much in advance for doing that. And if you want to find your way back to this channel, the best way of doing that is hitting that subscribe button. That will simply put my videos in your feed and you'll be able to come back here at your convenience. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you have a great day.